Now we're going to take a look at some of the environments on the Mississippi Delta. These pictures will be from a field trip I took with a group of students there several years ago. This first picture is of two of our boats we took out on the Delta, and we're in the interdistributary bay. You can see marsh surrounding the boats, and the water depth is generally very shallow there, a couple meters or maybe 10 feet deep. In the background, you can see some marsh. And here are some students sort of trapped in a marsh. You can see it's very muddy. It actually stinks like hydrogen sulfide. It's an important depositional setting on deltas, though. You get a lot of mud deposited on deltas. This is actually on the backside of a barrier island, and it's what's called an overwash fan. And we'll learn more about this in um, the virtual field trip to a barrier island. What we're looking at here is a sand overwash deposit back behind the student, and the barrier island is actually off in the uh, distance, and then the beach is on the other side of that barrier island. You also find swamps and bayous, as you see here, on the Mississippi Delta. There are also other features on the Mississippi Delta. As you see here, some oil tanks. Hydrocarbons, oil and gas, are produced from the Mississippi Delta and from offshore, and there's lots of infrastructure, as you can see here, out on the Delta. This is the levee in New Orleans. This is the man-made levee, which keeps the Mississippi River from flowing into New Orleans. You can see the Mississippi River on the left, and then New Orleans is off to the right. Now let's talk about what's happening currently on the Mississippi River and Delta. And here's this map that we started off with, but I'd like you to focus on some different things now. Start here at this point, and follow the Mississippi down through New Orleans, just south of Lake Pontchartrain, out to the Delta. Now look at this other river called the Atchafalaya. From this point right up here, it goes down to Morgan City, the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the distance that the Atchafalaya has to flow to get to the Gulf is about half that of the Mississippi. And it turns out the Mississippi River has been trying to change its course to the Atchafalaya for some time or the Chafalaya has been trying to steal the flow of the Mississippi, depending on how you look at it. Before we go on and talk about this in a little bit more detail, I just thought I'd show you a few quotes from a very wise man. Um, it's Mark Twain, of course. I'm not going to read these quotes. I'll just paraphrase them. He was very impressed with the Mississippi River and was concerned that um, we may try to change the river, but the river will always do what it wants to do. So keep that in mind as we're going through the rest of these slides. In the last hundred years, the Atchafalaya has captured more and more of the Mississippi River flow, as this table indicates. In 1900, it was about 12%. By 1950, it was 30%. And this caused a lot of concern. As a result, at a location called Old River Control, the Corps of Engineers built some structures to prevent the Mississippi from flowing down the Atchafalaya. The key structure here is the low sill structure you see right there. Notice there's a channel from the Mississippi into the Atchafalaya over here. There's also a large overbank structure shown right there. These structures, as I said, were built to keep the Mississippi in its current course. This is a picture of the low sill structure taken several years ago. There are two large cranes that move along railroad tracks, and these cranes pick up gates that allow water to flow through the low sill structure. Here we are looking down at one of the gates. The cranes would then pick up that metal gate in the center of the picture, and that would allow the water to flow through. Now, can you tell which side is the Mississippi and which side is the Atchafalaya? Well, you'll notice that the right side is higher than the left side. The right side is the Mississippi, and it's 15 feet higher than the Atchafalaya. Without those gates there closed, the Mississippi water would be flowing down the Atchafalaya. In 1973, there was a large flood on the Mississippi River and Delta. And as a result, the old river control was put under significant pressure. This is a very dark photograph, but hopefully you'll still be able to see the key features. The first thing to notice is the extensive amount of water. The Mississippi is on the left, 
The Atchafalaya is on the right. The low sill structure is right there. You can see there's water flowing through it from the Mississippi to the Atchafalaya. And this long, thin line right there is the overbank structure. Now, in 1973, the low sill structure almost failed. And this is a photograph illustrating the low sill structure during the flood. And you'll notice you see the sill structure here, and there are wing walls. There's one here. There used to be one similar to that on the other side, but it collapsed. And the Corps of Engineers was very concerned that the whole structure would fail. If it had failed, the situation in southern Louisiana would look very different than today. The Mississippi would probably have been flowing down the Atchafalaya. After the low sill structure almost failed, they decided they needed to reinforce that structure, but they also built another structure called the auxiliary structure to provide more control. What do I mean by control? Well, during major flood events, they would open the gates on these structures to let more of the water go into the Atchafalaya than into the Mississippi. That would then relieve pressure on the structures and the, so they wouldn't fail, so all of the water in the Mississippi would not go down the Atchafalaya. Here are some pictures, more pictures of the low sill structure. There you see the wing wall that did not collapse. And there's the other side of the low sill structure where the wing wall collapsed um, and they have a lot of rocks there piled up as added reinforcement. This is a view of the overbank structure, which in one of those previous photographs, there was water on both sides right up to the road. So what are the consequences of modifying the Mississippi River and Delta? Well, a key consequence is land loss in Louisiana. Here's a statement you may have trouble believing, but Louisiana is losing one acre of land to the ocean every 24 minutes. This is a major problem. There are several reasons for this loss of largely wetlands, including human development. A key reason for the land loss is due to deltaic processes and how we have modified the delta. For example, we build levees on the Mississippi River to control flooding. As a result, the Mississippi does not flood in the interdistributary bay area. Now remember when we talked about processes that operate on deltas. So long as you're adding sediment, the delta is fine. But once you quit adding sediment, there's always sinking going on. So you have a lot of sinking of land due to compaction of mud, or the underlying mud, around much of the delta. Now, when we build levees, we also channelize the Mississippi, so a lot of the mud and sand is carried out into the deep Gulf of Mexico and does not build any new land. So both of these processes, channelization and the levees, which are connected, contribute to the problem of land loss on the Mississippi Delta. Some scientists have argued that the mud and sand that is lost to the deep Gulf of Mexico is a very valuable resource. Why? Well, it's very good soil, and it's not adding new land, so it's lost to us, and it doesn't build new land that we can grow things on. We'll come back to that point a little later. This little simulation shows you land loss on the bird foot part of the delta, just part of the delta, from 1956 to 1993. It's quite dramatic. Of course, the blue is water, the yellow is land. And you can see that it was dramatic change from just from 1956 to 1978. Here's a map that shows areas where there's been land loss, which is red, or predicted land loss, yellow, for 2000 to 2050. And then it also shows land gain, or predicted land gain, in green. And you'll notice that in most areas, we have had land loss, significant amounts of land lost in southern Louisiana. There's only really one place where we're seeing much new land added, and that's over here on the left side, and that's over there by the Atchafalaya, where there's some building out of new land. But the predominant thing that's happening in southern Louisiana is land loss. And here are some projections of what the Louisiana coast may look like in 2100. Look at the right figure. New Orleans is basically 
surrounded by areas that are less than one meter in depth and would probably be principally water. The only parts of the land or the only land that's around are the levees. So that's a very serious situation for Louisiana. When you add sinking due to compaction and sea level rise, absolute sea level rise, you have some serious issues, or New Orleans has some serious issues. So here's another issue with New Orleans. In the background, we have a map of New Orleans, and then I have a little cross-section here of New Orleans. And you can see New Orleans is basically a whole. New Orleans is here, the different parts of New Orleans, and then on one side we have Lake Pontchartrain, and on the other side we have the Mississippi River. Notice that both Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River are higher, the water level is higher than most of New Orleans. So if those levees were to break, where would all the water go? Into New Orleans. And the levees did break during Katrina, and as a result, you had flooding in many parts of New Orleans. This is the levee on Lake Pontchartrain, and there's the Lake Pontchartrain with New Orleans back behind us from the levee. And then here's the picture taken from the levee looking toward the street level in New Orleans. And remember the point here is that both Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River are higher. The water level is higher than most of New Orleans. So if the levee were to break or to be breached, there'd be a major problem with lots of flooding in New Orleans, just as there was during Katrina. During Katrina, the levee at the Ninth Ward failed and many houses were destroyed. This is a picture from the levee toward um, the Ninth Ward. There used to be many, many houses on all those plots of land over there. They've only rebuilt one, at least in this picture. Um, and this was a major problem. Unfortunately, the Ninth Ward, the levee had not been well taken care of and it failed. Here's a picture of the new levee on the Ninth Ward. You can see both those pictures and the students horsing around, um, supposedly trying to stop the flow through some holes in the levee. But here's something interesting. Notice those houses, they're built up on stilts. You think those people are confident that that levee will hold? Well, think about it. If they're building their house on stilts, probably not. So why should we worry about land loss in Louisiana? Why should we save Louisiana's wetlands? Well, there are a number of different reasons. It's a major area of, for shipping and ports. New Orleans is a major port. There's abundant examples of recreational and commercial fisheries. And it turns out the wetlands are very important because that's where a lot of the fish spawn. It's a crucial habitat for waterfowl, alligators, etc. And maybe one of the most important reasons is that wetlands provide a storm buffer by producing friction to high force winds. So as a large storm like Katrina comes in, if it has to move over wetlands and land, it'll reduce the energy so when it hits New Orleans, it's not as strong. But if you don't have the wetlands, you don't have anything buffering the wind energy, so when it hits New Orleans, it'll be that much more powerful. So a number of different reasons to save Louisiana's wetlands. So what are we doing about land loss in Louisiana and on the Mississippi Delta? Well, the government is using diversions to artificially flood selected areas on the Delta to add sediment and try to keep up with the compaction. This shows a picture of one of the diversions. New Orleans is up here at the top. This yellow area shows where they take water from the Mississippi and sediment and let it flood down into this area. It's called Davis Pond. And this is a diversion where they're trying to add sediment and water to the Mississippi Delta, particularly the sediment to compensate for the sinking. This is very expensive and you can only do it in certain areas. You obviously can't do this in New Orleans because you have a city. You can only do it in an area where you don't have many people. So what are the consequences if the Atchafalaya were to take over the flow of the Mississippi? I'm not gonna read all of these, but you should think about these because there are some very important consequences of let, if the Atchafalaya were to take over the flow of the Mississippi. Economic ones, social and political. 
So what do we do? Some scientists have suggested the Mississippi should be allowed to change its course because of all the mud that is lost to the Gulf. If it did switch, then a new lobe and new land would be created. Other scientists suggest that we should allow the river to change its course because it will do so anyway in a catastrophic way and it would be better to control the change. This is an important issue we're going to be facing in the next 50 or maybe 100 years. You should think about what you think we should do on the Mississippi Delta.